Skills Module 7, Mobility, Activity, and Exercise. I would like to remind you to please review the course objectives on page 788 in Chapter 39, as well as be familiar with all of the key terms in blue. This chapter provides you with knowledge of exercise and activity as they relate to health promotion, the acute phase of illness, and the restorative and continuing care of patients, as well as nursing strategies to help plan and individualize exercise and activity program for a variety of patients with specific disease entities and needs. A program of regular physical activity and exercise has the potential to enhance all aspects of a patient's biopsychosocial and spiritual models of health. To reduce the risk of injury, Nurses need to understand and practice proper body mechanics and remain knowledgeable of current research, standards, and guidelines concerning safe transfer and positioning techniques. Scientific Knowledge Base Coordinated efforts of the musculoskeletal and nervous system maintain balance, posture, and body alignment during lifting, bending, moving, and performing activities of daily living. Proper balance, posture, and body alignment reduce the risk of injury to the musculoskeletal system and facilitate body movements allowing physical mobility without muscle strain and excessive use of muscle energy. Correct alignment involves positioning so no excessive strain is placed on any one joint, set of ligaments, tendons, or muscles, thereby maintaining adequate muscle tone and it also helps to contribute to balance. Body balance occurs when a relatively low center of gravity is balanced over a wide, stable base of support and a vertical line falls from the center of gravity through that base of support. When the vertical line from the center of gravity does not fall through the base of support, the body loses balance. Nurses use balance to maintain proper body alignment and posture through two simple techniques. First, widen the base of support by separating the feet to a comfortable distance. Second, increase balance by bringing the center of gravity closer to the base of support. Coordinated body movement is a result of weight, center of gravity, and balance. Weight is the force exerted on a body by gravity. People are not geometrically perfect. Their centers of gravity are usually midline at 55 to 57 percent of standing height. People who are unsteady do not maintain a balance with a center of gravity which makes them at risk for falling. You need to be able to identify these patients and intervene to maintain their safety. Exercise is a physical activity used to condition the body, improve health, and maintain fitness. Sometimes exercise is also a therapeutic measure. A patient's individualized exercise program depends on the patient's activity tolerance or the type and amount of exercise or activity that the patient is able to perform. Regular physical activity and exercise enhance functioning of all body systems including the cardiopulmonary, musculoskeletal, and psychological well-being as well as regular physical activity assist in controlling weight. The best program of physical activity includes a combination of exercises that produce different physiological and psychological benefits. Three categories of exercises are isotonic, isometric, and resistive isometric. Isotonic exercises cause muscle contraction and a change in muscle length in isotonic contraction. For example, walking, swimming, dance, aerobics, jogging, bicycling, and moving arms and legs with light resistance. These are all examples of isotonic exercise. These exercises enhance circulatory and respiratory function, increase muscle mass, tone, and strength, and promote osteoblastic activity, thus combating osteoporosis. Remember that osteoblastic activity is activity by bone forming cells. Isometric, isometric exercises involve tightening or tensing muscles without moving body parts. This is an isometric contraction. Resistive isometric exercises are those in which the individual contracts the muscle while pushing against a stationary object or resisting the movement of an object. In some long-term care settings, footboards are placed at the ends of beds. Patients push up against them to move up in bed. Resistive isometric exercises help promote muscle strength and provide sufficient stress 
against bone to promote this osteoblastic activity. Here you will see an example of a case study. Please take a moment to start working through this case study and it will recur throughout this PowerPoint. Regulation of movement. The skeletal system provides support, protection, movement, mineral storage, and blood cell formation. Joints are the connections between bones. Ligaments bind joints and connects bone and cartilage. Tendons connect muscles to bone. Cartilage is a non-vascular supportive tissue that acts as a shock absorber between articulating bones. Skeletal muscles determine body form and contour. Contraction of skeletal muscles allows people to walk, talk, run, breathe, or participate in physical activity. Muscles of movement are located near the skeletal region where a lever system causes movement. Muscles concerned with posture are activated as, gra as gravity continually pulls on parts of the body. Coordination and regulation of different muscle groups depends on muscle tone and activity of antagonistic, synergistic, and anti-gravity muscles. Muscle tone, or tonus, is the normal state of balanced muscle tension. Muscles are responsible for maintaining posture and movement. Antagonistic muscles cause movement at the joint. During movement, the active mover muscle contracts while its antagonist relaxes. Synergistic muscles contract to accomplish the same movement. Anti-gravity muscles stabilize joints. These muscles continuously oppose the effect of gravity on the body and permit a person to maintain an upright or sitting posture. The nervous system regulates movement and posture. Proprioception is the awareness of the position of the body and its body parts in space. Remember that balance is controlled by the cerebellum and the inner ear. More A&P review. Types of joints. Fibrous joints fit closely together and they are fixed, permitting little if any movement such as the syndesmosis, that's S-Y-N, D-E-S-M-O-S-I-S between the tibia and the fibula. Cartilaginous joints have little movement but are elastic and use cartilage to unite separate body surfaces such as the synchondrosis that attaches the ribs to the coastal cartilage. Synovial joints or true joints such as the hinge type at the elbow are freely movable and are the most mobile, numerous, and anatomically complex of the body joints. Ligaments. Ligaments are white, shiny, flexible bands of fibrous tissue that bind joints and connect bone and cartilage. They are elastic and aid joint flexibility and support. Tendons. They are white, glistening fibrous brand, white, glistening fibrous bands of tissue that occur in various lengths and thicknesses. The Achilles tendon is the thickest and strongest tendon of the body. It begins near the mid-posterior of the leg and attaches to the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles in the calf to the calcaneal bone in the back of the foot. Using principles of safe patient transfer and positioning during routine activities decreases work effort. When moving a patient, you want to incorporate knowledge of physiological and pathological influences on body alignment and mobility. Congenital abnormalities affect the efficiency of the musculoskeletal system in regard to alignment, balance, and appearance. So just take a few moments to think about what are some congenital abnormalities that affect the musculoskeletal system? One of the major examples I can think of is scoliosis. This is a structural curvature of the spine associated with vertebral rotation. Osteoporosis, osteomalacia, inflammatory joint disease, and articular disruptions are all examples of disorders of bone, joint, and muscles. Damage to any part of the central nervous system that regulates voluntary movement causes impaired body alignment and immobility. Musculoskeletal trauma often results in bruises, contusions, sprains, 
strains, and fractures. Nursing knowledge as it pertains to activity and exercise. Comprehensive safe patient handling programs include the following elements. An ergonomics assessment protocol for healthcare environments, patient assessment criteria, algorithms for patient handling and movement, special equipment kept in convenient locations to help transfer patients back, injury resource nurses, and action after action review that allows the healthcare team to apply knowledge about moving patients safely and a no lift policy. Nurses often provide care for immobilized patients who pos whose position must be changed, who must be moved up in bed, or who must be transferred from a bed to a chair or from a bed to a stretcher. Assess every situation that involves patient handling and movement to minimize risk of injury. After completing the assessment, nurses use an algorithm to guide decisions about safe patient handling. Use the patient's strength when lifting, transferring or moving whenever possible. Assume an active role in your workplace to ensure that a culture of safety exists and that appropriate patient handling techniques and equipments are readily available. Throughout the lifespan, the appearance and functioning of the body undergo change. The greatest change and effect on the maturational process occurs in childhood and in old age. The newborn infant's spine is flexed and lacks the anterior posterior curves of the adult. The first spinal curve occurs when the infant is able to extend its neck from the prone position. I would like to remind you that prone is laying face down or abdomen to the mat. The toddler's posture is awkward because of the slight sway back and the protruding abdomen. As the child walks, the legs and feet are usually far apart and the feet are slightly everted. By the third year, the body is slimmer, taller, and better balanced. The period of adolescence usually begins with a tremendous growth spurt. The healthy adult has the necessary musculoskeletal development and coordination to carry out ADLs. Normal changes in posture and body alignment in the adult occur mainly in pregnant women. As a result of the adaptive response of the body to weight gain in the growing fetus, the center of gravity shifts toward the anterior. A progressive loss of total bone mass occurs with the older adult. Body balance is unstable and older adults are at greater risk for falls and injuries. Patients are more likely to incorporate an exercise program into their daily lives if supported by family, friends, nurses, healthcare providers, and other members of the healthcare team. Other factors that influence activity and exercise include, include environmental issues. A common bar barrier for many patients is the lack of time needed to engage in a daily exercise program. Children today are much less active, resulting in an increase in childhood obesity. Schools can be excellent facilitators of physical fitness and exercise. Community support of physical fitness is also instrumental in promoting health and activity of its members. When developing a physical fitness program for culturally diverse populations, consider what motivates them and what they see as appropriate and enjoyable. Social, social support is also one motivational tool used to encourage and promote exercise and physical fitness. Companionship also provides for socialization, increases enjoyment, and develops a lifelong commitment to physical fitness. Critical thinking. To understand activity tolerance, physical fitness, and the effect on the patient, you integrate knowledge from nursing and other disciplines, previous experience, and information gathered from patients. As you plan patient care, consider the relationship among a variety of concepts to provide the best outcome for the patient. Professional standards such as those developed by the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Diabetes Association provide valuable guidelines for exercise and physical fitness. Your experiences and critical thinking attitudes affect the problem-solving approach 
with patients and are evaluated with each new patient. Remember that some patients have the capacity for recovery in spite of some loss of physical function. Restoration of function begins early in the care of patients whose ability to perform self-care is disrupted. Encouragement, support, commitment, and perseverance are important attitudes in critical thinking for these patients. Perseverance is necessary when caring for patients who depend on you for assistance with ambulation and exercise. In addition, responsibility for positioning often becomes repetitive and some nurses lose sight of its importance. Perseverance is especially important in delegating these activities to other personnel. Making certain that the task is performed correctly is an essential function of the registered nurse. Problems with activity and mobility are often prolonged. Creativity is necessary when designing interventions for improving activity tolerance and mobility skills. Once again, we will revisit the nursing process as it relates to mobility. Apply the nursing process and use critical thinking in your care for your patients. The nursing process provides a clinical decision-making approach for you to develop and implement an individualized plan of care. During the assessment process, thoroughly assess each patient and critically analyze findings to ensure that you make patient-centered clinical decisions required for safe nursing care. Complete the assessment of body alignment and posture with the patient standing, sitting, or lying down. Use assessment to determine normal physiological changes in growth and development, deviations related to poor posture, trauma, muscle damage, or nerve dysfunction, and any learning needs of patients. Ask questions related to the patient's exercise and acti activity tolerance to gather important information. During assessment, consider all of the elements that help you make appropriate nursing diagnoses. In patient-centered care, assess the patient's expectations concerning activity and exercise and determining individual perceptions of what is normal or acceptable. For example, one of the factors affecting physical activity is freedom from pain. When patients experience pain or fatigue following exercise, they often lack the commitment to, to complete the desired interventions. When patients are content with their present physical activity and fitness, they do not perceive a need for improvement. Please excuse the technical difficulties with the slide presentation. Assessment and Standing Assessment of the standing patient includes the following. The head is erect and midline. Body parts are symmetrical. The spine is straight with normal curvatures with a cur cervical concave curve, convex thoracic curve, and then a concave lumbar curve. The abdomen is comfortably tucked. The knees are in a straight line between the hips, ankles, and, the, and slightly flexed. The feet are flat on the floor and pointed directly forward and slightly apart to maintain that wide base of support. And the arms hang comfortably at the side. The patient's center of gravity is in the midline. And the line of gravity is from the middle of the forehead to a midpoint between the feet. Laterally, the line of gravity runs vertically from the middle of the skull to the posterior third of the foot. Sitting. Assessment of alignment in the sitting position is particularly important for the patient with muscle weakness, paralysis, or nerve damage. A patient with these alterations has diminished sensation in affected areas and is unable to perceive pressure or decreased circulation. 
Proper sitting alignment reduces the risk of musculoskeletal system damage. When assessing a patient in the recumbent position, place the patient in lateral position, removing all positioning supports except one pillow. The vertebrae are in straight alignment without the observable curves. Assessment of mobility helps to determine the patient's coordination and balance while walking. The patient's ability to carry out ADLs and the patient's ability to participate in an exercise program. Gait. Gait is the manner or style of walking, including rhythm, cadence, and speed. Exercise conditions the body, improves health, maintains fitness, and provides therapy for correcting a deformity or restoring the overall body to a maximal state of health. Assessment of activity tolerance is necessary when planning physical activity for health promotion and for patients with acute or chronic illness. This assessment provides baseline data about the patient's activity patterns and helps to determine which factors affect activity tolerance. Nursing diagnosis. These are simple examples of nursing diagnosis related to activity and exercise. Assessment of the patient's activity tolerance, physical fitness, body alignment, and joint mobility provide clusters of data or defining characteristics to support a nursing diagnosis. Just a reminder, all nursing diagnoses must be NANDA approved. Please take a look at the list of nursing diagnoses related to mobility. Please note that these, this list is not all inclusive. During planning, you want to synthesize information from multiple resources. Critical thinking at this stage ensures that the patient's plan of care integrates all patient information. Professional standards are especially important to consider when developing the plan of care. These standards often establish scientifically proven guidelines for selecting effective nursing interventions. Once you identify the diagnosis, you and the patient set goals and expected outcomes to direct their interventions. The plan includes consideration of any risk for injury to the patient and pre-existing health concerns. The general goal related to exercise and activity is to improve or maintain the patient's motor function and independence. Care planning is patient-centered, taking into consideration the patient's most immediate needs. You determine the immediacy of any problem by the effect of the problem on the patient's mental and physical health. Be, be vigilant in monitoring the patient and supervising assistive personnel in carrying out activities to prevent complications and potential injury. Planning involves understanding the patient's need to maintain function and independence. For example, it is important to collaborate with physical and occupational therapists. Sometimes long-term rehabilitation may be necessary. Remember, discharge planning begins when the patient enters the healthcare system. In addition, always, always individualize a plan of care directed at meeting the actual or potential needs of the patient. This slide follows through with a case study that goes throughout this PowerPoint. These are the goals set for the patient on the le left and the expected outcomes on the right. Implementation. Before entering an exercise program, you want to teach the patient to be able to calculate their maximum heart rate. This is done as follows. Subtract the patient's current age in years from 220. Then to obtain their target heart rate, you take 60 to 90% of the maximum, depending on the healthcare provider's recommendation. Coordinated muscle activity is necessary when positioning and transferring patients. 
the most common back injury is strain on the lumbar mu muscle group, which includes the muscles around the lumbar vertebrae. Body mechanics alone are not sufficient to prevent musculoskeletal injuries when positioning or transferring patients. Before lifting, assess the weight to be lifted. Determine the assistance needed and evaluate available resources. You want to use pa safe patient handling equipment when the patient is unable to assist with the transfer. In acute care, you want to encourage patients who are hospitalized to do stretching and isometric exercises, active range of motion, low, tensi low intensity walking, which, and all of this is going to depend on their condition. When patients cannot participate in active range of motion, maintain joint mobility and prevent contractures by implementing passive range of motion in the plan of care. Help maintain the musculoskeletal system during acute care by encouraging the use of stretching and isometric exercises. The easiest intervention to maintain or improve joint mobility for patients and one that can be coordinated with other activities is the use of range of motion exercises. Joints that are moved periodically are at risk for contractures that are not moved periodically are at risk for contractures, which is a permanent shortening of muscle followed by an eventual shortening of ligaments and tendons. Remember that walking increases joint mobility. You want to measure distance walked often in feet, sometimes in yards, depending on your healthcare facility's recommendations. Illness or trauma usually reduces activity tolerance, resulting in the need for assistance with walking or the use of mechanical devices such as crutches, walkers, and canes. Patients who Patients who increase their walking distance prior to discharge have improvement in their ability to independently perform basic activities of daily living, increase their activity tolerance, and they have a faster recovery after surgery. Please take a moment to review this quick quiz question. Helping a patient to walk requires preparation. Assess the patient's activity tolerance, strength, coordination, baseline vital signs, and balance to determine the type of assistance needed. Also, assess the patient's orientation and determine if there are any signs of distress. Postpone walking if you determine the patient cannot walk safely. You want to evaluate the environment for safety before ambulation. This includes removing all obstacles, a clean and dry floor, and the identification of rest points in case the patient's activity tolerance becomes less than expected or the patient becomes dizzy. Also have the patient wear supportive, non-skid shoes. You want to help the patient to a position of sitting at the side of the bed and dangling the legs over the side of the bed for one to two minutes before standing. Some patients experience orthostatic hypotension, a drop in blood pressure that occurs when they change from a horizontal to a vertical position. Dangling a patient's legs before standing is an intermediate step that allows assessment of the patient before changing positions to maintain safety and prevent injury of the patient. Several methods are used to assist patients with ambulation. Provide support at the waist so the patient's center of gravity remains midline. This is achieved through the use of a gait belt. A gait belt encircles the patient's waist and may have handles attached for the nurse or therapist to hold on while the patient ambulates. Restorative and continuing care also involves implementing activity and exercise strategies to assist the patient with ADLs after acute care is no longer needed. Restorative and continuing care also includes activities and exercises that restore and promote optimal functioning in patients with specific chronic illnesses, for example, coronary heart disease, hypertension, COPD, and diabetes. If the patient has a fainting or syncopal episode or begins to fall, you want to assume a wide base of support with one foot in front of the other, thus supporting the patient's body weight, as in photo A. You extend one leg and let the patient slide against the leg and gently lower the patient to the floor, protecting the head, photos B and C. When the patient attempts to ambulate again, proceed more slowly, monitoring for reports of dizziness, and take the patient's blood pressure before, during, and after ambulation. Again, 
more info for the case study on Maryland with Marilyn and Mr. M. Delicato. Please review. In collaboration with other healthcare professionals such as physical therapists to promote activity and exercise, we do this by che teaching the proper use of using those assistive devices such as canes, walkers, or crutches. Walkers are extremely light, movable de devices that are about waist high and made of metal tubing. They have four widely placed, sturdy legs. In the home, many patients prefer walkers with wheels or short, short runners on the legs that allow them to push the walker. Instruct patients on how to use walkers safely and avoid the risk of falling. Canes are lightweight, easily movable devices made of wood or metal. They provide less support than a walker and are less stable. A person's cane length is equal to the distance between the greater trochanter and the floor. Two common types of canes are the straight-legged cane and the quad cane. The single straight leg cane is more common and is used to support and balance a patient with decreased leg strength. The quad cane provides the most support and is used when there is partial or complete leg paralysis or hemiplegia. You want to have the patient keep the walker on the stronger side of the body. For maximum support when walking, the patient places the cane forward 15 to 25 centimeters or 6 to 10 inches, keeping body weight on both legs. The weaker leg is moved forward to the cane, so body weight is divided between the cane and the stronger leg. The stronger leg is then advanced past the cane, so the weaker leg and body weight are supported by the cane and the weaker leg. During walking, the patient continually repeats these three steps. The patient needs to learn that two points of support, such as both feet or one foot and the cane, are on the floor at all times. Measuring for crutches. The axillary crutch is the most common crutch used. Measurements include the patient's height, the angle of the elbow, and the distance between the crutch pad and the axilla. When crutches are fitted, ensure the length of the crutch is two to three finger widths from the axilla and position the tips approximately two inches lateral and four to six inches anterior to the front of the patient's shoes. Positioning the hand grips to the axilla are not supporting the patient's body weight. So you want to position those hand grips so that the axilla is not supporting the patient's body weight. Pressure on the axilla increases risk to underlying nerves, which sometimes can cause partial paralysis of the arm. So therefore, you want to avoid the patient hanging on the crutches. Determine current position of the hand grips with the patient upright, supporting weight by the hand grips with the elbows slightly flexed at 20 to 25 degrees. Elbow flexion may be verified by a goniometer, which you see here on the photo. When you determine the height and placement of the hand grips, verify the distance between the crutch pad and the patient's axilla. It should be approximately 2 inches. Gait with crutches. Patients assume a crutch bait gait by alternate, alternating bearing weight on one or both legs and on the crutches. You want to de determine the gait by assessing the patient's physical and functional abilities and disease or injury and the resulting need for the crutches. This photo summarizes the basic crutch stance and the four standard crutch gaits of which we will practice in the lab. Again, please disregard the technical difficulties.
When ascending stairs on crutches, the patient usually uses a modified three-point gait. The patient stands at the bottom of the chairs and transfers body weight to the crutches. The unaffected leg is advanced between the crutches to the stairs. The patient then shifts weight from the crutches to the affected leg. Finally, the patient aligns both crutches to the stairs. The patient repeats this sequence until he or she reaches the top of the stairs. Again, we will practice this in lab. Descending stairs with crutches. A three-phase sequence is used to descend stairs. The patient transfers body weight to the unaffected leg. The crutches are placed on the stairs and the patient begins to transfer body weight to the crutches, moving the affected leg first. Finally, the unaffected leg is moved to the stairs with the crutches, and the patient re repeats the sequence until reaching the bottom of the stairs. A good way to remember stair gait with assistive devices is up the stairs with the good extremity, down the stairs with the bad one. Because in most cases, patients need to use crutches for some time, they need to be taught to use them on stairs before discharge. This instruction applies to all patients who are dependent on crutches, not only those who have stairs in their home. You will frequently be, have to collaborate with the physical therapy team to ensure that instructions are provided about crutch walking. Sitting with crutches. As with crutch walking and walking up and down stairs, the procedure for sitting in a chair involves phases and requires the patient to transfer weight. First, the patient positions them him or herself at the center front of the chair with the posterior aspect of the legs touching the chair. Then holding both crutches in the hand opposite the affected leg, or if both legs are affected, as if the patient is paraplegia, you want to, with both crutches in one hand, the patient supports their body weight on the unaffected leg and the crutches, as in photo A. While still holding the crutches, the patient grasps the arm of the chair with the remaining hand and lowers his or her body into the chair, as in figures B and C. To stand, the procedure is reversed, the, and the patient, when fully erect, assumes the tripod position before beginning to walk. Again, in implementing this care, we need to design care plans to increase activity and exercise in patients who have these chronic health conditions. Research shows that activity and exercise play a role in secondary prevention or recurrence of most chronic diseases. Exercise reduces systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Some patients are fearful of participating in exercise because of the potential of worsening shortness of breath. This aversion to physical activity will set the patient up for more progressive deconditioning. Along with diet, glucose monitoring, and medication, exercise is an important component in caring for patients who have diabetes. Individuals with type 1 diabetes need to exercise because it leads to improved glucose control, cardiovascular fitness, and psychological well-being. Exercise must occur on a regular basis to have the desired continued benefits in the management of blood glucose levels, lipids, and overall quality of life. As with all care, we want to see care through the patient's eyes. For activity and exercise, you measure the effectiveness of nursing interventions by the success of meeting the patient's expected outcomes and goals of care. The patient is the only one who knows how effective and how beneficial the activity and exercise is for them. Continuous evaluation helps to determine whether new or revised therapies are needed and if new nursing diagnoses have developed. Again, when we evaluate, you want to evaluate the effectiveness of your nursing intervention, not the completion of the nursing interventions. This helps to enhance activity and exercise, make comparisons with baseline measurements that include pulse, blood pressure, strength, endurance, and psychological well-being, and also to compare actual outcomes with expected outcomes to determine the patient's health status and progression. Please review the case study throughout this PowerPoint presentation. If you have any questions, please email your instructor.